How much creativity and imagination do you think you would need to possess to be able to convince an organization like NASA to allow you to take a Buzz Lightyear toy and get them to send it into space and bring it back? Because of course we never leave an astronaut behind. Well, it would take the creativity and imagination of someone like our guest today, Duncan Wardle, the former head of innovation and creativity for Disney. Now, Duncan truly believes that all of us are born with the amazing creativity and imaginations and that we have this innate curiosity and built-in tool called intuition. And in today's episode of the Evolution of Business Show, we are going to get into the mind of the creative and imaginative Duncan Wordle, and he's going to share with us a bunch of tools and techniques that we can use to evolve ourselves, to evolve our businesses, to stay relevant in the hearts and minds of the people that we choose to serve. So I don't know about you, but I was so excited about this episode. I can't wait to share it with you. Here's Duncan. Welcome to the Evolution of Business podcast. Business is a series of evolutions. This podcast explores how to stay relevant in the hearts and minds of the people you choose to serve. It will look for the lessons and the failures of the past and share the success of those getting it right today. What is the next evolution of your business? Now, here's your host, Dave Clare. Welcome to the Evolution of Business Show. I'm your host, Dave Clare. And today we have none other than Duncan Wardle with us on the podcast. Uh, really enjoy Duncan's work and I'm really excited to have him as a guest on this. Duncan and I uh, spoke at a conference, wow, it was October almost two years ago now. Time flies, it seems uh, so long ago, but it was only two years ago. Uh, and really loved his message that he was sharing. And it was really great to be able to get him to come on the podcast here. Now, please understand that Duncan believes that we're all born creative, which I'm absolutely back all the way, and that we're born with amazing imaginations and that we're full of curiosity and carry this remarkable built-in tool known as intuition. Uh, and we'll probably talk about it very quickly with Duncan in time uh, as to wh wh why do we lose a lot of that or why does it get hidden over time. But as the head of innovation and creativity at Disney, Duncan and his team helped Imagineering, Lucasfilm, Marvel, Pixar, and Disney Parks to innovate, creating magical new storylines and experiences for consumers all around the globe. As founder now of ID8 and Innovate, he now brings his extensive Disney experience to audiences all around the world, using a very unique approach uh, to design thinking, and I've experienced it, it was quite amazing, that not only places the end user at the core of creative thinking process, but also looks in new and unusual places, uh, or even usual places, to uncover insights for innovation, helping people to actually capture unlikely connections leading to fresh thinking and disruptive ideas. And one thing I like about that part is that it's radically client-centric. Now he's delivering a series of keynotes, workshops, and ideation forums through his unique design thinking process to help companies embed a culture of innovation into everyone's DNA. Um, he's obviously a multiple TEDx speaker and a contributor to Fast Company Magazine. He teaches master classes at Yale, uh, University of North Carolina, Duke University, University of Florida. And in 2008, he received the American Citizen of Choice Award at the White House in 2014. Uh, he was awarded an honors doctorate from Edinburgh University in Scotland, and he also holds the Duke of Edinburgh Award for presenting Her Majesty, sorry, presented by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. You've met the Queen, Duncan. I have. I was 18 at the time. <laughs> 18 at the time? Well, it was a while back. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's, it's so exciting to have you. It's so good to see you again. Let's say it, it seems like two years ago that we, uh, we shared the stage at the uh, Get Amplified event here in Perth, West Australia, while you were touring around Australia with the Change the World events as well. Um, and I've been watching and following your journey all around. It's been very exciting to see the work that you're doing. And you know what, uh, if it wasn't necessary before, which it was, it is more necessary now than it ever was. Uh, this whole concept, and, and I love the fact of, uh, the, you know, those things that uh, the creativity and the innovation and the intuition that you're challenging people. So first question, before you get into your life story, why do we lose all that? What, where, where, how, do we, how does that get conditioned? Does it get conditioned out of us? Is it? No, it's called education. Um, we're all we're all born creative. When you got that Christmas present or your birthday present, it came in a giant box, huge yep. box, or your mum got, um, got a new fridge, right? And you got yep. that huge box. And, you, so, and uh, you got the gift, you played with the toy for 20 minutes, and what did you spend the next five days playing with the box? Why? Mm. 
because the boss could be anything you wanted. It was your rocket ship, it was your fort, it was your castle. And about five days later, it got a bit ratty. Mummy threw it out and cried. But um, so it was anything you wanted. And then you went to school and the teacher tells you it's just a box and your creativity. And the first thing you're told to do at school, I remember my art teacher, color inside the lines. You're like, oh, stop me. So, yeah. uh, so we're all born curious. But yeah. The number one question that your child asks you every day is why? Why? Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. Because they know you lied the first time. They're better, they're better than your consumer insights team at getting insights for innovation because your data and your insights team may stop at the first or second why. Children don't. They just keep going and going and going until they get yeah. to the real core consumer truth. So if you ask somebody through data, why do you visit Disney parks? The number one answer you're going to get through your data is we go for the rides. Oh, well, that just tells me to spend a couple of hundred million dollars on a new capital investment strategy. But if you pause for a moment and that childlike, not childish, and you say, well, why do you go for the rides? Well, I remember it's a small world. Why, why is that significant to you? I like the music. Why, 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 why do you remember the music? Well, it reminds me of going with my mum. Why is that important to you? I take my daughter now. On the fifth, why you got to the insight for innovation? She's not going for the capital investment strategy. She's there for her personal memory and nostalgia. That's a communication campaign, not a capital yeah. investment strategy. We're all yeah. born with amazing imagination. We yeah. all have those weird dreams that we think about at nighttime that we don't want to tell anybody about. And we're all born with intuition. You have 100 billion neurons up here. You have 100 million neurons down here. But think about the decisions you make every day and how many times you say, I went with my gut. It's a remarkably fast computer. And I'll tell you a story a little bit later about yeah. how we used intuition and challenged our data to create. Well, actually, we'll do it now. What the hell? Yeah. Um, land Paris is crazy. Come to just let it run. Disneyland <laughs> Paris had come to us and said, we need more people to come more often. So and our data told us who could afford us, who had an affinity to the brand, who was shopping online, who was a 10 out of 10 on a survey of them coming this year. Well, they didn't come. So I, I said, well, then they're either liars or procrastinators. Let's go find out. So we went and lived with 26 consumers for a day. And our going in hypothesis was if we build it, they will come. Why was that our going in hypothesis? Because that's the way we've always done it, right? We, we build new rides, people come. That's the yeah. model. Um, so let me ask you, do you have kids? Yes, we have three. Right, excellent then. Uh, do me a favor, close your eyes. There's a photograph of your children somewhere, probably in your family room or your living room. Without opening your eyes, can you see it? Yeah, 100%. Okay, and describe the photograph for us, if you would. Uh, it's a photograph, actually, it's the last photograph of the, all the three kids and my wife and I together. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, we're all sitting there. My son was wearing his military uh, gear, my eldest son. And there's the two little ones, uh, and we're all just in a big group hug, squeezing in to get inside the camera, and it's in the trees in the background uh, at uh, my mother-in-law's place. Okay. And how old were your children on the day that photograph was taken? That photograph was taken, my daughter was 10, my son was 12, turning 13, and my eldest son was uh, 18. And how old are they today? Uh, 21, 24, and 29. Bingo. So that photograph is 11 years old, so you can open your eyes. So here's the thing, inside each of our houses, we saw the same photograph. And I said to this lady I was living with, I said, um, how old are your children, love, four or five? She goes, no, love, they're 14 or 15. I thought, well, that's odd. So I wrote it down, it's an individual clue. It means nothing at the time. It's one data point and it's a lovely photograph. So it's one data point. So when we got back together, we all had the same clue. When we asked how old the children were in the photograph, it yeah. turned out they were anywhere from two years to 22 year old, 20 years older in reality. So you thought, hmm, does that mean we don't print photographs anymore? And my intuition was telling me there's something here our data's missing. We still yeah. print photographs of our children. We, we print photographs of their graduations, of their bar mitzvahs, of their uh, university, of their weddings. I thought, well, what's going on here? So we dug a bit deeper, and here's what you'll hear from mums uh, that you talk to. Um, when we ask what do we want for our children, uh, our first pass parents will tell you we want them to uh, go to kindergarten, junior school, middle school, high school, college, graduate, be happy, healthy, and successful. That's what we want. Yeah. No, that's a lie. We want them back in that little photo frame behind you when you still walk in the door at night, you're still a superhero. And that's why we love our grandchildren so much. They're right back yeah. in the frame. So we thought there's something here that our data is missing. So we dug a bit more. And here's what we found. And you've gone through all three of them. Um, you may not remember that. Chances are you do. You've got a daughter, right? Yes. Oh, you definitely yeah. remember it. So um, the first one, and now these are mums telling me the story, but I'm a dad, I've got intuition. 
And they talk about three bittersweet transitions that take place between a parent and a child. And as you go through that transition, um, you, you both immediately want to step back from it, but you both realize it's too late. I know exactly where I was the day my son was 10 years old. It was Christmas Eve. We were down in Mexico. He came around the bedroom door and he goes, Papa. I was like, what? He goes, are you, are you Father Christmas? And in that one split second, imagination, creativity, Batman, Superman, clout, gone. But what hurt was what he truly said in behind that was, I'm not your little boy anymore, Daddy, I'm growing up. Yeah. That hurt. Now, I wonder if you will remember, your daughter will not even remember this took place, but I dare say you will remember. I know exactly where I was, the second bittersweet transition. Um, we were just about a mile away from here, Kissimmee, Florida. We were walking in public. Uh, she was 13. I was on the curb. She was in the inside of the pavement. And it was about 10.30 on that Tuesday morning when she dropped my left hand in public for the first time because she didn't want to hold daddy's hand in public anymore. And dads remember where they were that day. Girls do not, right? And yeah. then the last one was uh, when we sent her off to college because, you know, we live in Florida. She went up to Auburn University and we packed her into her dormitory and we cheered and we hugged and we laughed and then we got in the car and cried her eyes out all the way home. So... Going in, our hypothesis was if we spend $200 million on a new attraction, they will come. Why? Our data tells us that. But by getting out of our offices and simply spending a day with our consumer in their environment, we learn what was truly important to them. They do not wake up in the morning wondering about whether or not Disneyland Paris is going to have a new ride this year. Mum wakes up every morning worried about how quickly her children are growing up and how she wants to make special memories for them while they still believe, while they still hold my hand while they're still here. That's a segmented communication campaign, one that drove record results and turned a very product-centric, we know best culture into a consumer-centric culture where it's mandatory now for every Disney executive to work one day a year in a frontline cast member position in the park and uh, one day every two years in the consumer's house. We're all born creative, we're all born with imagination, we're all born intuitive, we're all born curious. It just gets squashed out of us. But here's the thing, in the next decade, those four skill sets will be the most employable skill sets of the 2020s, simply because, and I've spoken to two or three uh, artificial intelligence experts about this, they are the four core human traits that will not be programmed any time in the next decade. So data yeah. analysis, that job's gone. Legal, possibly gone. Uh, finance, gone. Auditing, gone. All the things that we do with the right hand side of our brain can be programmed. But yeah. all the things that make us uniquely human, will they be programmed one day? None of us know. But it's not anytime soon. So actually the things you were born with that you've been hiding and suppressing for years because you're told they're not important, I believe will be the most valuable skill sets in the next decade. Yeah, like, and, and it's so... Um... To me, and I, and as I always think about, and we'll talk a little bit later about the future of work, future of leadership, what's coming through the future. But like, I, I fully agree. Like, I even remember when I was at school, I quit art. I think it was year eight uh, because I drew an apple. It's like you had to draw an apple. I drew my version of an apple. The teacher said that's not an apple, Dave. And I'm like, but it, art isn't art self-expression and interpretation. And I said, well, that's how I interpret an apple. And she said, no, you had to draw an apple. And so I dropped out of art. Um, you know, just things like that. It's just, uh, it's quite funny. And I remember my son's first birthday down at the park in Hillary's here in West Australia. Um, we were down there and gave him the box of presents and it opened it up, took the present, moved aside, literally grabbed the box and was playing with the box. And so it really leads me to think, you know, we always talk about thinking outside the box or thinking inside the box. Why don't we just think about the box? What, right? it be? That's kind of what you're suggesting is let's be creative with the box. Yeah, it's about challenge. Here's the thing. Look, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yep. The likes of none of us have ever seen, and God knows, hopefully, we'll never see yeah. again. But and so all I hear at the moment is, oh, we're pivoting. Well, guess what? If you're pivoting, you're going out of business because pivoting means iterating. It does not mean innovating. And the amount of industries that are just going to go, um, just think about the vir virtual, right? Uh, yeah. Look. People who hadn't shopped on Amazon 90 days ago probably shop on Amazon now. People who used to go to restaurants probably have Uber Eats now or whatever the service yeah. is in Australia. People who used to go to a gym are probably using a virtual gym now. Yeah. And so will we go back to dining, shopping, and everything that we, the way we did? No, we won't. No, and so not. it's about setting ourselves. But here's the blessing. The number one in a, a barrier to innovation for most people is they say, I don't have time to think. Mm. Uh, but now we do. And yeah. so uh, one of the tools that I think is very useful is – 
challenge the rules of your industry. You, why do we do weekly meetings? Oh, we've always had a weekly meeting. Why do we do weekly reports? We've always done a weekly report. Does mm -hmm. anybody read the weekly reports? No, they just edit the other bits out, then they send it to their boss, he or she edits, and then they say, nobody reads the weekly report, stop doing the weekly report. Yes. Um, uh, so so but here's, the, here's a wonderful tool, it was created by Walt Disney, and it's genius at getting people. The biggest barrier I find to most people of being able to innovate now is their own expertise. The more expertise and the more experience we have, the more we jump into our river of thinking and we're really good it allows us to make quick and informed uh, decisions about our industry but we're we being asked to get out of that river of thinking disrupt more and more often but it's hard because we're really good at that so yeah. a couple of tools that people could use one's called what if what if the rules no longer existed uh, yeah. it was created by walt disney uh, what was your big video rental store called in america it was called blockbuster what was the one in uh, australia it was uh, like video easy Video Easy. So, uh, yeah, we have founder of clusters here too, but Video Easy's were. I got you. Yeah. So, the founder of Netflix used to he he used to go to Blockbuster, Video Easy, and he yeah. like you had late fees, and he was fed up of paying yeah. the late fees. Yeah. So, step one, he listed all the rules of the industry. I must yeah. drive to a physical store. I can only go during opening hours. I can only get three at a time. They never have the one I want. <laughs> um, yeah. I must pay late fees. And he took one rule, and he said, "What if there was no physical store?" That was an absurd suggestion in 2005. He didn't know how to solve it. If you know how to solve it, it's iteration, not innovation. So he yeah. looks around the world, but sure enough, YouTube had already been around a decade. They were streaming amateur content. He said, well, wait yeah. a minute. I just need to do a deal with the studios. I'll stream professional content. Nobody will have to drive anywhere. I'll be open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'll cut the rental off at 24 hours so nobody has to drive. I know, I'll call it Netflix. I'll take my idea to Blockbuster five times. They'll turn me down exactly five times and I'll take them out of business in five years. Yeah. Um, it's easy to look at Netflix and say, well, they've got so much money. Well, he didn't at the time. No, but I'll, give you a small, I'll give you a small example to bring it to life. There was a very small company in Great Britain that used to make glasses that we drink out of. And mm -hmm. they noticed, on when they were shipping and wrapping and, uh, and getting the glasses out, there was a lot of breakage. So they went down to the shop floor and they used this tool. They listed the rules. They just watched their employees. 26 employees, conveyor belt, cardboard boxes, 12 glasses to a box, separated by car corrugated cardboard, glasses wrapped in newspaper, employees reading newspaper. And they thought, ah, that could be our production issue. So somebody asked a relatively provocative what if question. What if we poke their eyes out? Well, that's against the law and it's not very nice. But because <laughs> Because he had the courage to ask the absurd what if question, yeah. the person next to him immediately got out of their river of thinking. He said, well, wait a minute. Why don't we just hire, hire blind people? So they did. Production went up 26%. Breakage went down over 80%. And the British government gave them a 50% salary subsidy for hiring people with disabilities. It's literally about taking the rules of your industry, picking one and saying, what if that rule no longer applied? It's a yeah. genius tool to help people think differently. Oh, that is, uh, yeah, that's absolutely amazing. And, uh, and uh, when you were talking about Netflix, uh, so Mark Randall, he's got his book out, That'll Never Work, because he was told so many times that'll never work, that'll never work. Great book. Um, actually, I've been chatting with Mark about getting him on the podcast um, and bringing him here. But uh, yeah, fantastic. I didn't know about that. What was, you, what, what was the name of that company in the UK then that was the glass? Do you remember the name of it? No, just the glass factory in Nottingham. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> yeah, mate, that, that, but, that, but that's it. That's that, that how simple it is. And to me, you know, uh, innovation is always a, it's a very popular word down here in Australia, and I'm sure as it is in the world. But I, I think uh, people don't look at innovation like you look at it, or even my, my thoughts on it. When I look at the word innovate, I said to people, look, look at the word innovate. The word itself, in, is a prefix for within, and novate is to change or do something different. So the word itself tells you to change or do something different from within, which is innovate. And yeah, a lot never of people looking outside the latest and greatest innovation to bring into their organization rather than going inward and going, how, to your point, how can we break the rules, change the industry norms to that? Because if you want to disrupt your industry, the first place you have to start is disrupting your own self and your own business. Yeah. Well, it's another great tool about looking at, I find insights for innovation more often than not come from looking outside your industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I always bring in a naive expert. So what or who is a naive expert? A naive expert is somebody who doesn't work for you. Uh, what's the success criteria? They don't know about what you're working on. So what, yeah. what, makes them, what makes them successful? That gives them permission to ask the silly question that you can't ask. It gives them permission to throw out the audacious idea. And so they will say something. They won't solve the challenge for you. That's a very unrealistic expectation. They will say something that makes you think different. So uh, have you got a pen and a piece of paper there somewhere? Yeah, I'm using it right now. Yep. All right. So... Uh, I was designing a new retail dining and entertainment complex for Hong Kong Disneyland. I had in the room 
12 white male American architects. Well, that's yeah. called group thing. So I invited in a young female Chinese chef uh, simply because she wasn't there. And I gave them the following task that I'll give you. Yeah. I won't look at what you're going to draw. Um, I'm going to give you seven seconds to draw it though. Please, would you draw a house? Seven, house. six, five, four, three, two, one. Now hold your house up to the camera. I can't see it, yeah. but I'm going to describe it. There's a square at the bottom inside which is a door which is in the middle at the front on the ground. Two windows, probably still so insecure we draw bars over them. And the shape of the roof is a triangle. Now let's take a look, how'd I do? Ooh, shocker, we're twins, mate. Look at that, we're twins. So here, here's, what, here, come on. Here's, here's what just happened. You did exactly what the architects did. You went yeah. into your river of thinking. All your expertise and experience tells you that's what a house looks like. Well, the young Chinese chef, female chef, she drew a dim sum uh, piece of architecture, which looked like a round bamboo dish with a little Chinese lady waving out the window. When we held our pictures up, all of ours looked the same, except hers. Yeah. And somebody, and we laughed because it gave us permission to consider audacious architecture. Well, if any company in the world could consider audacious architecture, it would be the Walt Disney Company. On the way out the door, somebody slapped a post-it note over her drawing, which simply said, distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. Seven years later, the strategic brand positioning that um, guided the entire design of the resort was distinctly Disney, authentically Chinese. Um, no. Most companies do not understand the power of diversity. And obviously, mm. with a lot of conversation around Black Lives Matter in the last yeah. few months, most companies, they say they care about diversity. And then I'd answer the following question. Show me a photograph of your board. Mm. And if it's all white, then you're, then you're not walking the talk by a long way. However, here's what might help them. Diversity is innovation. If people don't think like you, uh, if they don't look like you, they don't think like you. And if they don't think like you, they can help you think differently. That yeah. is the power of diversity. Yeah. Um, and back to that innovation and creativity, because they're obviously always confused between the two. I just define creativity as the ability to have an idea, and we can all do that. And yeah. I define innovation as the ability to get it done. Yeah, and so like to me, I think the, uh, I go like, if you want to have innovation within your organization, well then your people need to have be creative, and everyone is creative, so creativity is the key to innovation. The, the, the ability to give people to be creative in your organization is they need freedom to think. They need to be area and space to think. And in order for them to have freedom to think, they need to have, be able to take responsibility for the work that they're doing. In order for them to be responsible, you need to be able to trust them. The way to trust them is to make sure that you have your core values in place, that you can build an environment, a safe environment where they're, they are trusted, they're responsible, they have freedom to think, they can be creative, they can be innovative. Yeah, but the problem is, as soon as they walk in the door, we shoot their ideas down and we say, oh, we, tried we tried that last year. That's yeah. not a strategic brand fit. That won't yeah. make our quarters. And we, again, the more expertise and the more experience we have, the more reasons we know why the new idea won't work. And so yeah. actually, yeah. look, we'll do a demo because this, I believe, can change culture. So Dave, yeah. I'm looking behind you. I see M&Ms. I see yeah. Iron Man. Yeah. I, see, yeah, I see a couple of Iron Mans. There. So let's do a Marvel party, right? I'm going to okay. come at you with some ideas for tonight's Marvel party. We've That's been given a $100,000 budget, pretty yeah. good budget for a party. Um, Every time I come up with you and I, uh, an idea, I want you to start your response with the words no because, and then tell me why we shouldn't be doing it, okay? okay. So I was thinking, right, we could actually all go in, in Oculus Rift. We could actually get into the Iron Man headset, and then we could just go flying around everywhere. Well, no, because we would spend the whole budget on that one thing. Uh, okay, fair point. Oh, I tell you what then, what if we all, we went on a diet first and then we put these amazing Spider-Man uh, skinny outfits on with these fake abs so that we actually look like we had abs? Well, no, because of two reasons. One, because uh, it would take too long for us all to on diet to lose the weight to be able to do that. We don't have the time for that because we want to have a party soon. And secondly, why would we need to have fake abs if we're already lost all that weight? Yeah, fair point. I tell you what then, what if we did a Guardians of the Galaxy inter- Galactic Food and Wine Festival. Once again, uh, well, uh, marketing promotion of that, uh, getting all the background. But we've got a thousand bucks to spend, mate. We don't uh, know because of that. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what then. So, question to you then. Um, how did that feel as an experience? Uh, it felt actually horrible because I'm, I'm trying to find reasons why we couldn't do it when I want to do all those crazy cool ideas. <laughs> But for the person throwing out the idea, usually they get demoralized or they just, you know, I'll wait, I'll get one, I've got a thick skin, yeah. I'll go past one or two no becauses. Once I'm on my third no because, I'm like, you know what, mate, you keep going, I'm gonna go and get a cappuccino. Yeah. Um, but would you say our idea was getting bigger or smaller? Uh, the ideas were getting smaller. I All right, know. so 
Transition. Are you familiar with Star Wars? Yeah, very much. My brother has the my brother has the biggest Star Wars collection in all of West Australia, if not all of Australia. Ooh, okay, so I oh, remember you sent me a couple of things. I was going to get you to come for a tour of his place. Yeah. So, so this time, same budget, one hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to come at you with some Star Wars ideas, yeah. and this time I want you to start with the words "yes and," and we'll build yeah. it together. So okay. I was thinking you could get the Perth. Symphony Orchestra, right? All dressed up as stormtroopers with their instruments, and uh, Darth Vader could conduct them with his uh, lightsaber. Oh yes, and if we did that, uh, can you imagine if we had the big screen in the background playing some of the big scenes going on while they're they're all there with their instruments and their and the lightsaber? But in the background was a massive big video screen of the Star Wars playing. Oh yes, and we could create this giant round hot air balloon blimp, and uh, we we were through black light. We could make it look like the Death Star. We could flaunt it over the bounty. Oh yes, and imagine if we had some laser beams coming out of it, and we had a, like a, an Alderaan, and one scene in the movie, and you just see this laser beam, and we do this little bit of an explosion, and like we could have this big moment. Yes, and we could turn the, uh, we could, we could ha actually have an intergalactic food and wine festival where we've got food from Naboo and Tatooine and Hoth and different recipes and we could crowdsource them. Oh, 100%. And before people even got in to see it, we could have the cantina set up outside so people having drinks at the cantina in Tatooine before they even get in. Yes, and glow in the dark lightsabers full of our favorite alcoholic beverage. <laughs> so, oh. Yard glass uh, lightsabers. Yeah, okay. Oh. Things you notice second time around a lot more laughter, a yeah. lot more hands waving in the air, yeah. um, a lot more energy. This time around, was the idea getting bigger or smaller? Oh, way bigger. Expanding, okay. expanding, 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 expanding. You can always take a big idea and value engineer it down. God knows yeah. we've seen that. Uh, yeah. But you can't take a small crap one and turn it into a big idea. Remind yourself, if you tend to be a reductionist or other people in the room, mm -hmm. we're not green lighting this idea for execution today. We're just greenhousing it together. But far yeah. more importantly, when we finished building that idea together, um, whose idea was it? Uh, in the end, it was ours. Bingo. Two small worlds from the world of improv that can yeah. transfer the power of my idea to our idea and accelerate its opportunity to actually get done. We all work inside big organizations. We've all got approval levels. We've all got hierarchy. We've all got local constituents. And the moment you can transfer the power of my idea to our idea is yeah. the moment you just might get it done. So um, I would encourage particularly leaders, when that young person comes into the room with a, a mad idea that you have no idea if you could pull it off or not, don't start with the words no because. Start with the words yes and. You're not doing it, you're just ideating it. Yeah, no, that's, and that's, uh, uh, and so if we, we start with what if, and then we go into the, uh, so what if, or what if we reimagined all these bits and pieces or whatever, um, and then we go into the, uh, not the no becauses, but the yes ands. Invite your naive experts. Okay. The other thing is, is be playful, and why should we be playful? So let me ask you a question. Yep. Where are you, close your eyes again. Yep. Where are you, and what are you doing when you get your best ideas? Uh, my best ideas, usually when I'm just uh, relaxing outside, listening to some uh, tunes, uh, some Caribbean country tunes, smoking a cigar and having a whiskey. Each to their own. Caribbean country tunes? What the hell's a Caribbean country? Anyway, so here's the thing. Open your eyes. Uh, yeah. You have asked audiences of up to a thousand people. I've asked people to write it down in audience of a thousand people. You're here yeah. jogging, walking, waking up, falling asleep, commuting, talking, doing a jigsaw, playing with the kids, rolling around on the floor, gardening, staring at a wall. The only two words I've never heard are at yeah. work. work. That's yeah. a bummer. Well, because now close your eyes again and picture that last verbal argument you were in with somebody. You're really angry. You're just you're screaming at each other. Yeah. Now, um, you walk away, right? And you, you, you're angry at Fred. You're so pissed off at Fred. You're never going to work with Fred again. So you go over to your local coffee shop. You sit down. You're beginning to relax about five minutes after the argument's over now. And what just popped into your head? Um, that I was feeling bad about the, uh, the argument and all the other things that I could have or should have said. Ah, yeah. the killer one-liner. The killer... Yeah. Perfect one line that you wished you'd delivered. Oh yeah, if I'd have said that, I'd have added, oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you ever delivered the killer one liner during the argument? Uh, not 
too many times. The odd occasion when I'm lucky, never with my wife, no. <laughs> it's five minutes later, isn't it? It's totally faster. But uh, so here's why. When you're in an argument, your brain is defending itself and it's a little busy. Guess what yeah. your brain looks like in the office? Emails, presentations, PowerPoints, blah, blah, blah. And we hear ourselves say, I don't have time to think. Yes. But that second that you gave yourself time to think, you walked into the shower, you fell asleep, you walked away from the argument, you came up with a big idea and the killer one-liner. So how do you get there on demand? I run Energizers. An Energizer is a fun 60-second exercise. You can find them on my website. I'll send you a link after. Uh, just to get people to laugh. Why do I want laughter? Because, uh, and I'll explain why. You're, we live in four brain states during the day. Most of us live in busy beta. Yeah. We're stressed. And the door between our conscious and subconscious brain is firmly closed. But here's the bummer with that. 87% of your brain is subconscious, only 13% is conscious. So you've only working with 13% of the capacity of your brain. But what if you could have access to the other 87%? What right? Yes. So all I do is I run an energizer and I listen for laughter. The moment I hear laughter, I know I've opened that door just wide enough between your conscious and subconscious brain, that you can access all that stimulus, but still make an informed decision. And for those of you who said falling asleep or waking up is where I get my best idea, it came from Thomas Edison. He used to, uh, that expression, when the penny drops. Uh, yeah. He used to fall asleep at night in an yeah. armchair, uh, a penny between his knees, um, a tin tray on the floor. As he fell asleep, his muscles were relaxed, his knees would open, the penny would drop, it make a noise, it would wake him up and he'd write down whatever he was thinking. And, and you can think, oh, that's stupid, I wouldn't do that. Well, okay. Well, who had more patented inventions in the 20th century? Yeah. Than anybody else? Yeah. If you're yeah. one of those people who gets your best ideas when you're falling asleep or waking up, just keep your notepad by the bed because you yeah. promise yourself you remember them when the alarm goes off, but you never do. No. So uh, it's about being playful at the right time. You don't need to be playful every minute of every day, but no. you do need to be playful, particularly as a leader, when you're trying to run an ideation session. And the other thing I always do is, I'll always brief in the ideation session four or five days before it actually happens. Why? Because people will go to the places where they are, where they have their best ideas. They'll go for a shower, hopefully. They'll yeah. go walking, they'll go to bed, they'll go. So they're already coming armed with lots of ideas. So it's a nice place to start. Yeah, and I think from the whole creativity process, especially in organizations, like I certainly challenge my clients and, and people that I work with to make sure they bring their ideas to the table, not when they're at, because what happens, imagine everyone, okay, here's, we're going to challenge this or whatever. And everyone goes, okay, what's a great idea? And then people, some will say that. And they're like, oh yeah, I like that idea. That's the one. But, but they had a much better, or the, maybe the question that would have triggered something which would have, you know, that crazy absurd question that they didn't ask because they just settled mm -hmm. for what somebody else had said. So I insist that everyone, because everyone is creative, I don't care. Um, I don't know is not an answer. Come with something you do know. Tell me what you do know and bring that to the table. I don't care if it's crazy, absurd, you name it, but bring it to the table because everybody is creative and it's it's very yeah. human nature to listen to everybody else, right? And go, yeah, that, that that's a better idea. Yeah, I think it's also you put sometimes just simply reversing the challenge to get people to stop thinking as they always do and to help them think differently. Uh, yeah. Let's say I was coming to Perth and yeah. I'm, you and I are going to go into business, Dave. We're going to open a car wash together yep. and tell me, tell me the three or four essential ingredients we would need to put in our car wash, the things we have to have. We have to have, well, we definitely have to have, uh, obviously, the equipment. And the equipment? First, or, or the people, it depends if we're doing a manual or automatic one. So people, um, obviously, the, uh, the, the water, we need water. To, yeah. water. Um, we need a physical structure to, or space. Yeah. Got it. Um, and we need people. We need people to... Yeah, that's a good list. So screw that. I'm, we're, I'm still coming to Perth, but this time, baby, you and I are going to open an auto spa. Now, what could you put? What could we put in our spa? What have you seen in the spa? Like auto spa, like we could do car massages. We could do, you know, you think pedicures and manicures for cars in terms of like the wheels and the... Imagine how we could do that and pamper your vehicle. You know, we could uh, you. have um, highly trained uh, professionals in there. We could even, you know, uh, little bits and pieces. We get you know, when the ladies get their nails done. We could we could do little uh, color things mm -hmm. for the cars. In less than ten seconds, I stopped you from your river of thinking. Water, yep. brushes, vacuum dryer, people, building. Suddenly, we've got masseuses, mani pedis, and wax. Maybe for the car, maybe for the people. Yep. All I did was re-express the challenge. In 2011, instead of saying how might we make more money. By the way, yeah. Well, the last hundred years, we all got to say, how might we make more money? And it worked. 
Um, yeah. You won't be able to do that anymore. Why? Because Generation Z care more about purpose than profit. Not only will they not buy your products and services if they don't believe in what you stand for, they don't want to work for you. Well, how the hell are you going to be relevant 10 years from today if this generation says, I don't want to work at company X? So by simply re-expressing the challenge, if you continue to say, how might we make more money, you will iterate and you'll hit your quarterly results. If we said, how might we make more money, we'd have put the gate price up at the Disney Park by 3%, you'd have all paid us, and we'd have made our quarterly results. Great. Yeah. But we reversed the challenge, and instead of saying, how might we make more money, we said, how might we solve the biggest consumer pain point? Everybody knew what it was, standing in line. We said, what if there were no line? What if we eliminated the front desk in all of our hotels? Nobody had to check in or check out. What if we took away the turnstile at the front of the parks? What if you didn't stand in line for your favorite ride or your favorite attraction or to pay for merchandise or food and beverage? Mm -hmm. And we looked outside of our industry and we found RFID technology. We just put it in a little plastic band, call it Disney's Magic Band. It is your room key. You don't check in or check out. It is your theme park ticket. It's got your reservations for your favorite character meet and greet or your rides on it for today. If I want an item of merchandise sent to my hotel room, I'll touch it. It once if i want it sent to my house i'll touch it twice if we'd said how might we make more money we'd have made our three percent but by reversing the question and asking it from the consumer's point of view yeah uh, record revenues record guest intent to return record guest intent to recommend uh, record revenues on food and beverage and merchandise because people have two hours free time they didn't have four years ago and data collection over 20 million people a year coming through the gates live crowdsourcing the future to design of the products and services Disney creates by simply telling them what they like and what they don't like. Now, again, it's easy to look at Disney and say, oh, their resources are unlimited. We could never do that. So I'll give you a smaller, more tangible example like the car wash and the auto spa. I was in a waiting room uh, up in New York about a year ago waiting for an appointment. There was this young lady behind the reception desk. We were just chatting and I went upstairs and said to the boss, your receptionist, she's delightful. I'm stealing her. She's going to work for me. And he goes, oh, he said, well, how long were you chatting to her for? I said, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, I suppose. He goes, oh, okay, that's odd. I said, well, why is that odd? He goes, well, we don't have a receptionist. <laughs> I was like, shit, who the hell was I talking to for the last 10 or 15 minutes? I said, well, her name was Sarah. She had a, cr a cream blouse. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. Sarah's our director of first impressions. Uh, Boom. Well, with, that yeah. simple, with that simple yeah. re-expression of her job title. She yeah. was empowered to own the space. I hear, I go to these um, HR conferences and you hear this term, human capital management. That is an abhorrent term that everybody, yeah. you just stop using because we're actually called people. Um, yeah. And I, I went to my uh, daughter's office up in New York. She's, uh, they, uh, the CFO looks like he's 16, but I think that's my age more than anything else. Yeah. And uh, I met their uh, senior vice president of HR and she handed me her business card. She was probably about 28. And it's just a chief happiness officer. I thought, yeah, your job is to recruit and retain the greatest people on the planet. Therefore, what's your job to make them happy? Therefore, you're the chief happiness officer. Yeah. It's simply about re-expressing the challenge to stop people staying in their river of thinking and help them think differently. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I love that. Actually, when I used to run a not-for-profit uh, well, many years ago now up in Geraldton in West Australia here, our trainee at the front desk, reception desk, was the director of first impressions. That was what their title was. And I cool. understand it because they're the first person to either see someone walk through the door or answer the phone. So they were the first point of contact. And as I said, I said, you are the representation of the culture of our organization. It all starts with you. And as yep. you, you, your actual role is the most important role in the whole organization because the impact that you have on the client's initial experience that we all have to back up. So you set the standard for us as the director yep. of first impressions. And it was really, really powerful exercise. Um, and I think it's great. And um, so it's good to see your daughter because I remember when we first talked, your daughter had only just started then. She went up to Manhattan or wherever. Well, now, sadly, she got furloughed. Obviously, New York is not the yeah. place to be. Uh, yeah. She got furloughed from March until last week and she got laid off. So lots of tears. Yeah. It was her first job. Um, so, Australia, if you're looking for a 25 yeah. <laughs> social media girl, no, let me tell you, you know what I love about her? Her yeah. perseverance, man. She didn't give up. She's done 10 interviews in the last two weeks and she's hell bent on going back up to New York and she's going and she's going to go get a job. And she just, Correct. I'm like, I have nothing but admiration. So Australia, if you're yeah. looking for a 25 year old social media guru, yeah. I've got one. Just saying. Does she do all your social media for you? <laughs> um, you know what? It's a conversation we're about to start to have because uh, yeah, maybe. Why not, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to just get it because before we wrap up towards the end, we've got a few questions I'd like to get through. 
uh, we'll take that as your guest story. Thank you for sharing all that. There's a couple of, there's one story that you didn't tell or one part you didn't do in there, um, which is, uh, you know, it took, took how many people at NASA to put man into space and man on the moon, but it took one person to coordinate with them to put Buzz Lightyear into space, I believe. From memory, that was you, was it? We were just brainstorming ideas to get people excited about the opening of Toy Story. And I just said, hey, what if we made Buzz Lightyear's dream come true? And people are like, what are you talking about? Well, Buzz's dream was he wanted to fly. He couldn't fly. It was a toy. I said, well, yeah. what if we make his dream come true? And people are like, how are you going to do that? I was like, I'm going to send him into space. Of course, I hadn't had the conversation with NASA at the time. Yeah. So I went to meet with NASA. And the event, you could tell that half the room loved the idea. And half the room, but nobody was going to say so first. Stick in the account. Yeah. Half of them just wanted to not even bother opening the window. They just wanted to throw me straight through it. So anyway, NASA was <laughs> to take and Buzz. Style, right? <laughs> so they were to take Buzz. And with about six months to go to launch, we get a call from Johnson Space Center. And they said, hey, we need Buzz Lightyear here tomorrow. I was like, what? The launch isn't for six months. They said, well, we need two identical Buzz Lightyears here tomorrow. I said, what for? And they said, well, we're going to take one of them apart, molecule by molecule. I was like, oh, yeah, because? They said, well, if we find uh, an atom, a plastic uh, a bubble the size of an atom inside his plastic that could explode in the vacuum of space and kill one of our astronauts. I was like, yeah, totally. Yeah, I, the, yeah, absolutely. That's what I would have done. <laughs> so then, then I I of, <laughs> here's the irony, right? In those days, we only sold Buzz Lightyear when there was a new film out. So we couldn't, so I thought, don't tell me this deal's going down because Disney can't find. I had 37 cast members in every retail store in Central Florida looking <laughs> Oh, Buzz Lightyear. Oh, for God's sake, this is ridiculous. So we found one. We couldn't find the other one. And this was in 2005. We didn't have smartphones. Yeah. So I get a call on my old Motorola Flip. Still yeah. the cool phone on the planet. Yeah. Um, right. Captain's log. Yeah. <laughs> a yeah. bunch of purposes we were. Anyway, so, um, and I got a call. And all I could hear was, two and 30, of you I was like, who the hell is this? And it was, it was my wife. She goes, immediately. I said, where did you, where'd you find him? She goes, has been underneath James's bed collecting dust. I was like, oh shit, turn it over. So um, just as Andy wrote his name on uh, Woody's foot, I wrote James on Buzz's foot. And I sent it off to Nats. I said, don't destroy that one. That's a real little boy's Buzz Lightyear. So off he goes. So I, I, when we went down to the launch, I got really emotional. <laughs> I was like, I'm sending my boy into space. And then about a year later, we were opening another Toy Story. I thought, shit, how the hell do you stop sending Buzz into space? I thought, I'm going to bring him home. So I called the director of comms up at NASA. I said, um, hey, when are you bringing Buzz back? Then? Total silence on the other end of the phone. Yeah. He goes, what do you mean bring him back? And I was like, well, no man left behind, right? <laughs> and he goes, that wasn't part of the contract. That wasn't part of the deal. I said, well, you bring everything back, right? He goes, no, we don't. I said, well, what do you do with the stuff you take up? He goes, you just open the hatch, push it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You can't incinerate Buzz Lightyear in the Earth's atmosphere. I'll leak it to the world's press that NASA killed Buzz Lightyear. So God bless. <laughs> my, tongue was so far, my tongue was so far in my cheek. And God bless NASA. They brought Buzz home. And um, it was one of the days where he couldn't land in Florida and that you, because of the bad weather. So the shuttle yeah. lads at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Yeah. You, you're probably, well, you're probably not as old as me, but those wonderful images of the space shuttle on the back of a 747 yeah, yeah, coming yeah. back across the country. I've got that passenger manifest, literally the piece of paper. And it's seat 1A, Senator, blah, blah, blah. Seat 1B, Congressman, blah, blah, blah. Seat 1C, head of NASA, astronaut, blah, blah, blah. Seat 14B, Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> Buzz is coming home, people. <laughs> uh, if, uh, if, if you get a chance to come back to the United States after this horrible yeah. pandemic is over, yeah. if you go to the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., you will find Buzz Lightyear. A gift of James Wardle. So there you are. Um, whether yeah. or not you think, well, here's my favorite quote, and I, it yeah. served me well throughout the years. Whether or not you think you can or think you can't, you're probably right. If you yeah. think you can do something, you'll get it done. It's yeah. Just persevere, right? Yeah, absolutely. I love that one. Um, so how do you see the difference between growth and evolution? Because I did a lot of business, I don't know, here in America, but in, in Australia, we had this big growth mindset, grow, 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 and, but, and no different to Blockbuster, was growing and growing, but they didn't evolve. Um, and to me, I'm really obsessed with relevance and, and to me, like, you know, the work that I do is helping people evolve themselves, evolve their businesses to stay relevant in the hearts and minds of the people that they choose to serve. But I, I, I battle this growth mindset and that people are just more interested in growing their businesses rather than evolving their businesses. Yeah, I guess I'd answer it by if you don't like change, you're going to hate irrelevance. Yeah, no, no, I know that was on your, your site, which I love. And I think if that's one of my favorite quotes. 
if we don't reinvent ourselves now, we're gone. Museums, yeah. museums are boring. Museums have always been boring. Yeah. I was in a museum in Brussels six months ago and I saw this little boy, three years of age, walk up to a painting and he tried to swipe it like an iPad. I was like, oh my God, I feel like a dinosaur. Uh, and so I thought, oh. but here's the thing, right? With augmented reality now, what if Vincent van Gogh or what if Donald Duck could jump out of the painting and go <laughs> like that old Vincent van Gogh could hold his ear out and say, this is why I cut my ear off. It's about turning things into an experience for people. If you're yep. not an experience, you're a product or a service. And if you're a product or service, you belong on Amazon. And people right. aren't going to come. Anymore. Walt was a genius. He realized the power of experience first. Yeah. Um, and because he created an experience, um, so he created the six most successful shopping malls on the planet. Disneyland, Walt Disney World, Disneyland Paris, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. People don't think of them as the six most successful retail malls on the planet because yeah. Walt created an experience first. He reinvented Retail. Yeah, you reinvented the shopping. Yeah, now, really. now we fast forward to 2005, Universal Studios buys Harry Potter. So this is the power of experience. Until they owned Harry Potter, a Coca-Cola was a Coca-Cola and they would not get out $2.50. Now, Dave, to you, it's a butterbeer and that's $11.50. And this plastic stick you see before me that you wouldn't give me two cents for? Yeah. Actually, Dave, this is Dumbledore's wand and it's $64 plus tax and you will happily purchase it while you're here. Um, yeah. It's about creating an experience but the experience we're going virtual far quicker than we thought we were we were going virtual anyway but the acceleration of virtual now i did some work with the nba a couple of years ago they believe virtual basketball revenue will exceed real basketball revenue by the year 2040 they believe virtual basketball will be in the olympic games by 2040 we created two pilot teams the orlando magic against the new york knicks they were virtual teams virtual gamers and on average, if on a real game, the Orlando Magic gets 12,000 people to a game because they're not that great. But when they, the virtual teams met, they had 32,000 people, 3 million people online, and they made $250,000 selling virtual merchandise. Hello. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, if you're not looking at virtual, look, look corporate Australia, right, are going to figure out if they haven't already, 50% of their back of house employees, marketing, sales, IT, uh, finance, they don't need to go to the office. Think of the money I can save on corporate real estate. Oh yeah, and that's so, happening right now with this pandemic. Virtual's coming really Everybody's going to take work from home now. Yeah, look at my industry. I mean, I did 132 speeches or workshops or ideation forums last year yeah. in 132 different cities. Uh, this year, no, it's gone. So I could sit still and, and I could iterate or I could reinvent myself. And so I've been doing some experiments with Oculus Rift, yeah. uh, running a... a, a uh, a, a workshop for Apple in Oculus Rift in a couple yeah. of weeks' time. Um, I've done another one in Vabella where it's actually a virtual campus where I can actually go and run workshops. Uh, and there's this other new technology where, believe it or not, now uh, through Zoom and another piece of technology embedded, I can speak in 15 different languages simultaneously through an artificial intelligence robot. And it doesn't make any mistakes and it scrolls onto your screen in any language of your choice or you can put your AirPods in and listen to your life. So it's about, you know, have I had to reinvent myself in the last three months? Yes, we all have. But those who just think they're going, you're not going back to business as usual. We're all going back to business as unusual. Yeah, no, and that's what I'm like, you know, it's really fascinating to me because everyone here is eager to get back to business. Like, let's get on with business. So, you know, say so you might get back, go back to where you were, but you will not be moving forward the way you were. And that's, I understand, like, accept that. Because what's happened is it's almost like uh, everything has been torn apart and it's been recomposed, but not exactly as it was before. So it's been recomposed. So if you're going to do, you know, paradox of success is whatever got you to here, won't necessarily get you to there. So if you're going to try to do the same things in this recomposed world, it's just not going to work. And you'll become right. a recomposed world. And so, like, would you see start, that? Sorry? We start to look more locally now. Uh, and we seek to reduce carbon emissions and yeah. we seek to create a sustainable, uh, you know, how are we going to feed the world's population, right? And yeah. so I challenged somebody, oh, it was uh, Dow DuPont, they asked me to give a speech and they only produce genetically modified crops, which obviously a lot of people have a real issue with. Uh, and so the head of innovation at the end of my talk got so inspired, he stood up in front of everybody and said, what if everything we created was organic? And you could hear a pin drop inside that building. And I said, well, yeah. wait a minute. I said, what if you could get the consumer to do it for you? And everybody looked at me like I was start raving mad. I said, well, hang on a minute. There's a young man in Orlando uh, with a small company, started about three years 
ago, they now have a list of a, uh, a waiting list of 18,000 houses. They will come to your house for free. They will dig up your front garden for free. They will plant vegetables for free. They will grow those vegetables and harvest them for free. You, the household owner, can keep as many vegetables as you want. The average householder can only keep about 5%. Yeah. Um, and that young kid now gets to sell the locally sustainable produce to local restaurants, for what, which is what they're getting, local sustainably reproduced produce, which is what they want. He's reducing carbon emissions and making a bucket load of money. And the yeah. household owner is getting as much free food as they want. That is a genius business model. And I said to Dow to Plant, I said, here's the thing, though. This kid can't scale it. You could. You could do this in every household in the nation. And it, yeah. may only represent, it may only represent 1% of your profit margin. So what? Your brand, instead of looking like the big bad guy, you look like a bloody hero. It's a just about thinking differently and reinventing the way we've thought before. Yeah, and what might be 1% today, maybe 50% tomorrow or 100% you know, mm -hmm. in the years to come. I was like, the business you're not in yet is way bigger than the one you are in. You just don't know it yet. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. And that's so. And so you think about yeah, sports, sports, sports needs to go virtual and it needs to go now. Okay? And if they don't figure it out, they'll be gone. Yeah. So, what are, well, what are, and whether we have to answer this or not, what do all the athletes do then? If they're not going to be, you they know, won't be athletes. yeah, isn't it? Be, and, and, but the new athlete will be a 16 year old kid on a gaming control. Yeah. Well, uh, one of my uh, clients said, one of their uh, team members, Mitch, he's a actual commentator for virtual sports. And he gets flown around places to 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 commentate on these virtual uh, tournaments and stuff like that. Like it's like, and I'm like, how long will it be before you know that sort of stuff is uh, is possible? I, I, and this might be a really bad example. I've said to uh, people when they talk about you know thinking creativity and all this in the future, and I said we have twenty young young twenty year olds in sea containers in the middle of the desert somewhere flying drones who can pinpoint an individual and take them out. Don't tell me that we can't find a way to do something and that you don't have the resources of people have found, you know, it's just, if we can do that at that level right now. Well, look, can't we here's, the, here's the analogy I will give you and then multiply it by industry. Yeah. You, and I, you and I will never shake hands again with another human by, being as long as we live. Why do I believe that? Because shaking hands is a habit. And habits can go away. If you don't shake hands for two years, that habit will be gone. Yeah. So now multiply that by the change that's coming to every single industry on the planet. That is one tiny change yeah. in our life. But now multiply that by the rest of the change that's coming. Yeah, absolutely. So from a personal evolution, you're probably going through that right now in terms of your evolving to, to be who you need to be going forward with this thing there. What's the biggest business evolution that you feel that you've, you know, so that from a leadership point of view, you've done that? But from your from a business point of view, what was the biggest evolution that you were for you in business? Somebody told me ten years ago you will never be good at helping other people learn to innovate until you enjoy giving. And I thought, and at the time I was quite a selfish executive in a big company. And I thought, man, I don't, I'll never teach anything. I don't enjoy giving. Um, I love it. I absolutely love it. And as a result, I've been enormously successful in the last four yeah. years. I mean ridiculously successful um, wow. so it was just it, and I just thought what are you talking about enjoy giving um, and this year I was supposed to be actually I was supposed to be in Perth this year for uh, two weeks and I was going to Mumbai for two weeks for free I wasn't going to charge a penny my clients were going to cover my uh, my travel but I was going to come and run a series of workshops for free for um, deserving people to help them innovate and learn how to innovate um, but here's the thing there's this massive gap in the market. We're all being told, we, you must innovate, we must take risks, we must think differently. Yeah, okay, how do I do that? Yeah. That's all people want to know. And all that people say, well, why did you leave Disney? Well, yeah, 30 years, thank you. And I was head of innovation creativity, had a lovely time, but there's this monstrous gap in the market. I thought, you mean I just have to teach people how? I thought, well, all I'm going to do is create a toolkit that makes innovation easy, creativity tangible, and the process fun. Why is it fun? You can't talk culture change. You have to give people a toolkit they choose to use when you're not there. And so that's what I do. I travel the world running innovation workshops for people. It's about, here's the problem, because if you create an innovation team, 
Does anybody else in your organization do legal other than the legal team? No. IT? No. Sales? No. Market? No. When you create an innovation team, the message you've just sent to everybody else in the organization is, oh, we've got an innovation team. Oh, thank God. I can just keep doing business as usual. That's so, terrible, not mine. Yeah. To be successful, you have to embed innovation into everybody's DNA. And in order to do that, you have to give them a toolkit they choose to use when you're not there because it's easy, tangible, and fun. Yeah, 100%. And I, and I love that. And it's it's like, uh, and same for me, like, uh, like I obviously help people with their purpose and, and their values, vision, mission, all that sort of cool stuff to build their cultural frameworks. And um, But what I, in terms of where I saw the gap is everybody knows they need to have a why, you know, Simon Sinek's already labeled all that. He's done all the great work in that space. But what I work with is here is nobody knows how to why. Well, and the other thing is, most people don't know what purpose is. They still, yeah. oh, let's get, let's get a philanthropic cause. Oh, let's do a yeah. charity. No, Corporate social responsibility is not purpose. No, it's who are you, what do you stand for, and what are you giving the world? And so I was asked to give a talk recently to, let's just call them the largest tool manufacturer in the world. They make yeah. lots of hammers, chisels, and saws. Exactly. So I thought, how can I learn more about their consumer? So I went down to their, uh, the big DIY stores in the States, and I just listened and watched their consumer at the point of purchase. And I went back to talk to them. I said, hey, this generation, young millennials and Generation Z, they're not talking about your brand, your products, the hammer, the chisel, or sword, the price point. They're talking about what's important to them. We're going to remodel our dream bathroom, our dream kitchen, our dream apartment. I said, your purpose, if you choose to create it, is you could be the brand who helps people build their dreams. Now, you can see the finance guys rolling their eyes and laughing and saying, ha, this guy's a jerk. We'll never meet our quarterly results. Well, no. Crap, yeah. Uh, no, but I might save your job, but actually your career or your industry. Oh, but wait, no, it's too late. Here's the thing. If you're a brand who can help people build their dreams, could you be in sports? Yes. Banking? Yes. Finance? Yes. Insurance? Yes. Uh, education? Yes. Uh, architecture? Yes. Uh, entertainment? Yes. Hospital? You could be in any industry you want to be. No, no, we make tools and we're really good at it. We're going to expand them to India and Mexico. They have a growing middle class. They will buy our tools. Um, no, they won't. We're building, yeah. houses. We're building houses in Houston, Texas today on a 3D printer. Um, yeah. I put it, uh, well, um, Amazon spends millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars on shipping. They don't want to. It is Amazon's best interest that we all have a 3D printer in our house by the year 2035. Mm -hmm. I put it to you that by the year 2035, 30% 30 of what you buy on Amazon, you will print at home. A book, you'll print it at home. A small table, a chair, you'll print it at home. Clothes, you'll print them at home. If you can print pretty much anything you want on demand 15 years from today, yeah. what, will you be, what will you make with a hammer, a chisel, or a saw? Oh, no, that's right. They'll be lined up next to Buzz Lightyear in the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, yeah. But because they don't have a purpose, they can't see their way out, and they don't realize they're actually gone. They just don't know it yet. But, yeah, they'll hit their quarterly results for the next three yeah. years. But, uh, yeah. but that's, uh, I think, Blockbuster had its best year the year before it went under, did it not? Probably. Yeah. The, and, and I... <laughs> Probably because I was the last guy in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Be kind of real. Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is a cool thing about purpose. I, I say purpose gives opportunity. It doesn't limit you. It doesn't define you or confine you. It just gets you very crystal clear about the problem you're most passionate about solving in the world. Not the product, not the service, not the how, not the what, not the thing. And, and that, I think, is really important. And, and that's what uh, you're talking about with, those, with the tools. Well, I, I fully agree. People will say, what's my purpose? Uh, it's easy. I believe everybody is creative. Uh, yeah. And I have a mission to prove it. That's it. Yeah, right. Here's the in here, we've, uh, we've been being told. Born to be creative, right? That's oh, what you're well, here's the thing. Oh, you're in finance, you're not creative. You're in IT, you're not creative. You're in legal, you're not creative. You've been told you're not creative for so long, you've forgotten how. We're hmm. born creative. It's just yeah. about giving people a toolkit to bring it back. Yeah, absolutely. Mind you, creative accounting isn't always a good thing, apparently. Um, so the oh no, but hey, but the Walt Disney legal department kept me out of jail, so you know it couldn't. It was yeah. <laughs> All right. So next three years, what well, give us one or two big things, mate? That what like the future work, future leadership? We've talked a little bit about it, but if you were to sum it up, and humans and technology and uh, and all that, what what do you see? What's the next three years? Well, number one, I've mentioned it before, is the acceleration into virtual very very quickly. Um, number two is at least in the short term, I think we're all going to go local. I really do think we're going to go local. I think, um, you know, because greenhouse emissions, uh, sustainable agriculture, I think you're going to see cities. Here's the thing. Now, the, the experts have all said that the 
the big cities will just continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as people draw themselves into the big cities. I've always argued, and now post-pandemic, hell yeah, I argue, I say no. I say people are going to go and live in the middle of nowhere in a really nice place and work from there because they can. Um, So I, I will still argue that. Um, and, and so I think that uh, I think the biggest thing we're going to see is companies that uh, companies are going to go out of business because they refuse to innovate because they're frightened. They're more worried about quarterly results than taking a risk. I'd say the biggest thing we're going to see in the next three years are some of the biggest monstrous brands in the world are going under because they're still product centric. They're not consumer centric. They don't have a purpose. And without one, they just can't survive. Yeah, very cool. Uh, very fascinating. We will see many amazing new businesses born, I think, too. That, yeah. you know, like the, the apples of the future that might be so, bigger than the apples, that they're just, they're like just starting today. So I'll give you one other prediction which wraps back to creativity. By 2050, India will be the world's greatest superpower and it'll put China in its shadow. Why do I believe, why do I believe that if China is so superior to India today? Um, so the vast majority of it's, uh, the India's population rivals China this year and it will continue to outgrow China. That's not important. Mm-hmm. The percentage of people in India underneath the age of 25 far outstrips China. That is not important. The percentage of people in India that can speak English completely outstrips China. That's not important because we'll have a Google fish in our ear within three yeah. years where you'll talk to me in Australia and finally I'll be able to understand you. I'm Canadian, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, um, no, but it's none of that. It's 1.4 billion entrepreneurs. Now, yes. you asked earlier, you asked me your first question, what kills creativity? Education kills creativity. Yes. And so China's education system is actually very similar to the West, and it's very repeat, 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 stay in between the lines. It doesn't encourage innovation, risk-taking. That 1.4 billion starving people out on the streets every day, figuring it out for themselves, I'll put 1.4 billion entrepreneurs against any corporate culture on the planet. Yeah, and I think it's without, because actually the global entrepreneur network that exists um, I've got Jeff Hoffman coming on the show. He's, he's one of he's the chair of that. But the majority of them, and there's um, Entrepreneursville and all that. Majority of the people are from India. And like, oh, well, yeah. yeah. By the way, your creativity. The reason yeah. they'll continue to beat the living crap out of you and us at mm-hmm. cricket is this: they don't have cricket pitches in the middle of their slums. I've seen kids playing on trash, trash as high as this room, yeah. a field of trash. But they're using a little stick, not a cricket yeah. bat. And the ball is bouncing off the trash. Guess what? They can hit it. That's yeah. why Australia. That's why England and Australia are screwed because we've yeah. got smooth pitches. Well, that's what the, if you go back to uh, Sir Donald Bradman here in Australia, he used to practice with a uh, with a wicket, like or with one of those sticks, and, and a golf ball, and that he, that's how he used to hit. So he could hit that golf ball no matter where it went, um, and because yeah. that find that close, which is why he was one of the best. Well, the, historically the best batsmen around. But, okay, so last question for you then is a random one. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not going to let you away with that comment. <laughs> Sachin Tendulkar, my friend. Or Virat okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll back it up. I don't think you say there's no Canadian cricket player who will even... Oh, no, probably not. <laughs> uh, all right. So I have here a question randomizer, 31 questions. You don't get to see them, but you get to pick a number between 1 and 31. But the only thing is you must answer the question. Now, some of them are all a bit random, crazy. Some of them are cool. Okay, here we go. 31, reverse re-expression, 13. Lucky for some. There you go, 13. Okay, which is good, because that actually is my life's favorite number, which is why uh, this question actually goes in there, which is, what is your go-to karaoke song, Duncan? Oh, well, my <laughs> so I'm British, therefore, you know I can't dance. And you know I can't sing. However, my nieces and nephews from Mexico know that if they get Uncle Duncan plastered at yeah. about 2.30 in the morning and they whack on Dancing Queen by ABBA, Uncle Duncan owns the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll call you back at about 2.30 your time <laughs> and we'll get you live to the uh, Dancing Queen himself, Duncan Warren. Mate, uh, yeah. So, uh, mate, thank you so much for asking that. And it's a, it is a very cool song. It will definitely get me onto the dance floor. I'm, um, I'm a go-to Elvis guy, but uh, why well, probably off to the screen you can't see over here. There's a bunch of Elvis stuff over here. Well, um, 
So uh, yeah, but definitely when we get to uh, be able to travel again, you and I will we'll get out there. We'll uh, we'll do it. The uh, dancing queen. I'll be there with you, brother. Right. And how can people get hold of you? Where's the best way to get uh, if they want to just find and follow you? Um, watch yeah, your um, usually the fox and hounds. No, I'm just kidding. Um, DuncanWardle.com. D u uh, n c a n w a r d l e dot com. Beautiful. All right, mate. Yes. Um, thank cool. you so much. Yeah. I always enjoy uh, chatting with you. I remember a couple years ago, we even did a little bit of a live before the, the event. Um, the work that you do is so, so critical in the world today and going forward. And people, like, just please continue to keep to helping people to how to think and understand and embrace the fact that, that we all are creative. Um, for the work that I do with clients that know that there's people like you there who are driving this message, I think uh, going forward that it's mission critical for everybody now this whole curiosity, intuition, creativity, innovation, uh, start embracing it. Um, and, you know, and first accept the fact that you have it and rebuild those school, uh, sorry, skills and talents and know that there's tools and workshops from people like yourself out there who can, can help them. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing in the world. Um, keep on your mission and uh, I look forward to uh, chatting with you um, again in the future and, and hopefully when we're allowed to travel, we get back down to Australia. Yes, you're round. Yeah, 100%. We, I think we have a fox and hound here somewhere too, so. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks again. Cheers.